This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice. So you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manasero. Old dogs, and welcome to Fun Facts Friday. This is our once a week, only on Friday show, where we have special episodes, not featuring guests, where I will share tricks, tips, terminology, and techniques that will help skyrocket you to real estate investing success. Today's topic is slugging it out in the trenches, an indie update. Hey, fellow old dogs. In my uh, uh, previous podcast, I talked about, uh, hey, you know, give me feedback on the show, what you like, what you don't like, etc. And and uh, I really do want to continue to ask for that and, and uh, get your feedback because I, I am getting some great suggestions. And uh, one of them came from one of our listeners, a guy named Adam. And basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a longer email, but I'll give you the highlights of it here. And that is... He was just saying he wants to hear more about the personal process that uh, I go through in my investing. And it feels that the information is valuable to any investor, as usually most podcasts are interviews with some guy who just bought 98 apartment complexes, something that I will never, ever get to do. In the email, he goes on to say, I just want to get enough to do what I have to so that I don't have to work. So hearing firsthand struggles from someone who's slogging it out is the best. Here's my suggestion. He says, can you start all of your Friday podcasts with a personal update of your properties? Even if it's a boring update, like nothing much happened to me. So that was kind of it. So that's so much better than, you know, maybe moving into a, just a topic only type of focus. So, you know, Adam, I am going to do what you said. I think you got a great suggestion here. And I I think that, uh, I think we're going to, we're going to try and do this, uh, more of this anyway. So today, all right, Adam, you asked for it. You got it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But before I get started, I just want to check in with you. I hope you're doing well with your investing. You know, I, I realize I say that a lot and I, and I don't want you to think I'm just flippantly saying that I really do care and I, I want to see you succeed and, and I'll do everything I can from my, my vantage point here to, to make things better. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not looking at this as blind optimism. Believe me, I, I, I do recognize that you have challenges out there and that, uh, not everything is, uh, you know, all that rosy. Yeah, I know it's tough. It can be out there and, uh, things I'm going to share today. I think you're going to see, um, yeah, I know it's tough cause I'm experiencing it firsthand. So you're not alone. I mean, maybe, uh, you are and you're investing out, uh, in wherever you're located, but, uh, you've got all of us old dogs here, uh, cheering and rooting for you. Another investor wrote me too this week and, uh, yeah, this is the it just hit me hard. You know, he has lost roughly over 125000 in his investing and has had um, just a, a considerable problems uh, with a certain turnkey provider um, that I've mentioned before and even interviewed on my podcast, but have since removed the podcast from our archives. And I really felt bad for this investor. I, I know we all kind of make mistakes. It doesn't take uh, somebody else that we're involved with, but a lot of times we do trust people out there, whether it is a coach or a person on a podcast. We need to be accountable. Everybody out here that is sharing information and advice And I I put myself in that uh, audience as well. So I really feel really bad for him. And I'm hoping that uh, things are going to turn around for him. If you're struggling, you know, take heed. You're not alone. This is a very tough business. And, you know, a lot of people have tried this. And uh, for one reason or another, are no longer doing real estate investing. Two people very close to me, my own brother. He had, uh, I think he had about five or six houses 
at one time and bought them right before the crash and uh, got some of those great loans out there. And uh, unfortunately, you know, just had, if it wasn't a financial struggle, it was uh, dealing with tenants and, and uh, declining property values and a lot of other things. And so uh, he, I think, only has one house right now. And my best friend since fourth grade, uh, uh, Ken Malloy, he had uh, uh, investment property as well and, uh, and no longer owns it uh, when he was uh, living in the Dallas area. So I know in many cases, you know, there may be bad loans, equity losses, skyrocketing expenses, tenant problems, and all those things hit us all. So I, I don't fault anybody that, uh, you know, makes the decision, hey, you know, I, I can't I can't do this anymore. I know it can be frustrating. I get frustrated uh, many times. I've said, "Oh man, what am I doing?" But uh, I'm, you know, trying to keep keep moving forward. And I know that if I do, I'll do well. You know, I think uh, with uh, some of my smaller investments, especially, I've found that the smaller rentals are the ones that are giving me more of a hard time. One big repair or multiple months of vacancies or other factors can cause you to operate in the red. I mean, you just, boom, you already eat up all your your cash flow for that year. It's not difficult to do. With all the things going on out there, I I still feel really good about my 22 unit. And you're going to hear some horror stories today, but you know, I'm still encouraged. It's still providing a good cash flow for us to live on. It is uh, uh, doing what it's supposed to do. It can be better, and there's a lot of room for improvement. And I'll share some of those with you today. Um, just a quick overview on some of the other properties. A single family in Atlanta that I have in the Forest Park area. Um, it's done pretty good for the most part. I had a couple of major repairs that ate up a lot of cash flow. A roof, uh, I think an air conditioner and some uh, water heater, some things like that, that, that can be really costly and bite into your, your funds. So I bought in a decent area though, and I think that that has helped. Uh, I, I noticed also in sharing and talking with other investors, you, know, you buy in a good area, or, you know, a B area, uh, you know, you're going to have a, a lot less problems than you are in uh, C and, and lower. Also, our homes in Memphis. Memphis has been a struggle. Um, I do have a new property manager there, which has helped out, uh, you know, quite a bit. But, uh, you know, I've still got, uh, I've, I've got one property that's been empty for about six months and uh, destroyed by Section 8 tenants, pending over $6,000 in repairs to get it up and rentable. I mean, I'm tempted to sell it, but because the neighborhood has declined so much, I'm, I would lose a lot of money on the sale. So I'm still working that one out. I've got a duplex. Uh, one side's got a tenant. Uh, the other one, we just did 3000 in repairs, and uh, that's uh, ready to go. We've got applications we're processing right now, so hopefully I'll have somebody in there soon. But the first tenant uh, is behind in the rent, so maybe they're testing out the new property manager. I don't know, but uh, we, know we may have to uh, evict that person. So it's a process. Uh, in Indianapolis, I have a duplex there. You never hear me talk about it because it's always going great, um, just consistent cash flow, good tenants. If there's a vacancy, it is filled immediately. We haven't had any vacancies in a long time. Um, it's in a good area though. It's in a good area and uh, that makes a difference. So let's talk about the 22 unit. Okay. And I bought this in the path of progress. Uh, it's an area in transition, but what do you do in that situation? Now, how long is that gentrification or whatever's going on in that area going to, uh, happen? Is it going to be three years, five years, 10 years? Well, you know, I don't have much other option, but to wait to a certain degree, yeah, unless I can accelerate things and make things better, but I can't change the neighborhood as a whole. I can definitely make my property nice and encourage other owners around there to do the same. But basically I'm kind of waiting for things to happen. So in that, uh, let me let you know, here's some of the latest exciting stuff going on in that neighborhood. As you know, I converted three units to Airbnb. Um, and I mainly did that because one, the Airbnbs, they pull in like twice the rent of my other um, units. And uh, because of the turnover and trying to bring in new good solid tenants, um, it's filled that income gap for me. I have uh, targeted for the Airbnb 30 day minimum stay guests. So that's kind of nice because we don't have a lot of people going and coming out of the apartment, which would might be disturbing to the tenants. We have people that are going to usually stay there anywhere from one month to three months. And so it's, it's pretty good. 
we get a lot of traveling nurses, students on internships, uh, business persons. Uh, it's proved to be a good financial move for us. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad we've had that um, as we've had the lull in, in some of the other units. But the apartment community and the local neighborhood have not been too welcoming to some of our Airbnb guests. And some of them have uh, left. I've shared in previous broadcasts about that. Um, we had a traveling nurse there. only lasted a few days. She woke up to somebody running down the hallway, banging on doors and screaming. Um, and that, if that didn't convince her to leave, uh, the fire in the building did. And so she left. She was supposed to be there for three months. Um, had a graduate student there that uh, had a laptop and phone stolen out of their room. Um People say they saw it. It was somebody from a neighboring building, so it wasn't somebody in our building. But uh, nonetheless, he's, we're still trying to get uh, get that guy um, covered. Airbnb says that they will cover it, but they haven't really committed to anything at this point. We found one of our uh, tenants actually had a prostitute and a crack addict uh, living with him, and uh, both of whom solicited my Airbnb guests for either money or sex. Okay, so that uh, that's really... Um, you know, just part of the welcome package there at the hotel. I mean, at the at the apartment. Uh, so that guy, luckily, this guy has a good sense of humor, but uh, he wasn't real thrilled. And his wife, who wasn't staying with him but was get, hearing the stories, was was uh, just uh, absolutely upset. It was pretty bad. So there was a tenant couple, apparently, that new tenants just moved in, fighting and screaming in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, like clockwork every night. Oh, we had uh, some good-hearted tenant who was lending a homeless guy sleep in the in the laundry area, and uh, my cleaning person came in, saw this, called the cops. Cops came, uh, found drugs on him, arrested him, but he got out and he came back. And uh, he may have been the one to set the fire. We don't know for sure. Some people say that that's what happened, um, but uh, just to let us know that he loved us, he defecated on the walls. Uh, so that was. Uh, interesting. We hired a security guard for a few days to put people at ease. And uh, he was pretty bored, except uh, when nightfall came and people were having sex in their cars in our parking lot. Um, so what I learned from that was well, a lot I learned. But um, the main thing was, uh, you know, I we found some bad tenants and I found out that through my Airbnb guests. And uh, they didn't want to tell me until after they left. And after they left, I got some specific apartments. And so we're moving forward with some evictions on this uh, and trying to identify any other problems that might exist there. We really believe it's only a few folks. So we, we think that it can be rectified rather rather quickly. Uh, we sent notes to each tenant uh, mentioning, you know, that what was going on, that people were coming in that shouldn't be in there and encouraging them to sort of form a neighborhood watch uh, type of atmosphere. We provided them with phone numbers to call for specific incidents that they might witness so that they can feel safe in the place that they're living. Um, we've also uh, installed security cameras uh, outside and inside uh, all floors so that we can monitor. We have uh, uh, not only is it being taped, any kind of movement is being taped, um, but uh, we have access to the cameras through our phones. The, the property manager has uh, the TV screens in, in his office. So we'll be able to you know, pick up the phone and, and if we see something and call the police right away or any on-site people that need to take care of something there. So, so that's going to help. It's also going to make tenants feel more secure. And um, we're also doing a lot of rehab. We're still doing rehab putting in these really nice, solid, you know, metal fire, fire doors on all units, uh, six panel doors. They, they look really great. So those are, again, going to make people, I think, feel more secure. They're going to see the cameras, which is also going to help them. Um, and we're doing upgrades to the property, trying to just try and improve it and make it, make it look better so we can attract a higher level of tenant as we have these vacancies from these evictions that are happening. We're still looking for someone to live in the apartment. I think I might have mentioned that before. Someone who would be willing to stay there at reduced rent to act as either like a house mom or dad that, that just reports things that happen. Or maybe somebody that has more of an active role uh, where they could get even free rent if uh, they could act as a handy person at the apartment. So we're still looking for that person. I think it'd be best to have somebody on site, but uh, we're trying to build everything we can to work around that. 
I have uh, for our Airbnb units, now we have three of them, there's a lot more activity. So we've hired what's called a co-host. And now this is really kind of an interesting thing. Um, also an interesting job because this is a person who doesn't really own Airbnb properties or they may also own them, but they they are basically paid a percentage of the the fee, um, the um, guest fee, to be the welcome person for these Airbnb guests. So when they come, uh, there's somebody there that greets them, that uh, says, hey, I'm so-and-so, and and I will be here if you need me. Here's my phone number. Here's, you know, you can text me, what have you. Uh, If you need anything, I'll let me know. And they basically welcome the person and are kind of the -the on-the-ground person if they have any issues. And uh, that has helped a lot. It's been really, really good. And so so I've got a couple of really good people doing that that are, have a fair amount of experience. One even has a, uh, I think they both actually have real estate the licenses, so they can also act as leasing agents too. I might even add a fourth unit. I'm seriously considering adding a fourth uh, Airbnb unit. Some people have said, why don't you just convert the whole thing to Airbnb? Um, I, I don't know. I'm just taking it one unit at a time. <laughs> so, um, but I, I can understand the, the economics of that. And uh, it would also eliminate a lot of the other problems, hopefully. I have clamped down on my property management firm, giving them strict standards and an ultimatum regarding the types of tenants that they're placing and that I'm looking for and have really defined that. Also, I'm at the same time, I'm keeping an eye out for other property management firms and uh, should the ultimatum <laughs> not be met. You know, their biggest complaint has been, oh, we just can't get the quality applicants, so we just take the best out of the group and if this is the best out of the group, I mean, my goodness, that's going to be a pretty rough group. So I uh, actually had lunch with uh, one of our guests, uh, uh, Neil Bawa, who was on episode 211. It was called The Scientific Approach to Real Estate Investing. And he is uh, just a fascinating guy, great guy, engineer turned full-time investor. Uh, he, he talked about this property he had in Chicago that he was having difficulty with. It was a low-income area, 70% occupancy, drugs, prostitution, a lot of the same issues that were going on in ours. And uh, his whole focus was, okay, you know, let's find better tenants. Okay, yeah, it may not be the best area, but there are some people that will come to that area. So what he did is he, by sheer volume, he got a wide screen of prospective tenants And from those tenants, he gets some pretty good people. And I think he has managed through this process. And it's real interesting. I'll just go over the process real quickly with you here. He uh, carefully studied the whole tenant lead system and how do you get tenants, where they come from, and saw that leads grow cold very shortly after uh, somebody places them. For example, if you go on apartments.com and you fill out the form, what you're looking for, and it goes to the, the various apartments, that within a few hours that grows old because the people that that get those tenants are the people that respond quickly. So what he has done, and now he's got over a thousand units and they're all at around 95% occupancy. And the way he's done it is he lists his properties through 29 different online portals, you know, online uh, portals like apartments.com, Hotpads, Trulia, Zillow, Craigslist, etc. And they generate responses. The responses go immediately to his team of 17 virtual assistants in the Philippines. And I think he also has some in India who immediately within the hour call back the lead, screen the person and book a showing date with his on-site you know, on the ground in the U.S. leasing agent. They also uh, call the prospect before the, their appointment, remind them. The day of, they remind them. They give them directions to the place. They do everything they can to ensure that prospect makes that appointment. Then it's up to the leasing agent and the property, of course, to sell them. So their current system is generating something like 12,000 leads a month. So I, I, I really, this really moved me. I was going, this is great. And I think he might even commercialize this software. But I thought I'd adapt sort of my own little system under my auspices here of stealth tenant marketing. And um, I'm working with my assistant who is basically doing everything that their people are doing. She's placing the ads. She's renewing the ads. Uh, she receives, as soon as she gets the response on the ads, she'll call um, and uh work with the person, screen them, book them for an appointment. We've got one of our outside leasing agent. We're using one of our co-host people to also show our apartments that are available for rent. And we'll, I think we're going to have four or five available here once these evictions go through. So we really need to move quickly. So the idea is that uh, you, you'll get this big pool of good 
qualified people, hopefully, and not maybe not all of them are qualified, but you'll, you'll get a good large uh, pool of people that you can work with to show the property to. So that's just a, a, another little thing that we can do. Kind of threw a lot of stuff at you, and I know I'm running a little bit long here, but, um, you know, I just, I, I know there's a lot of things we can be discouraged about, but there's also a lot to be encouraged about. And despite all the problems, you know, in this property, I things are going good. And as far as the, the numbers are concerned, they'll, they'll be going good when I can, you know, keep, you know, good people in there and keep the bad guys out. We are working really hard at trying to do that now. That's what we're, we're, we're looking to do. I'll keep you updated as uh, and let you know how our little stealth tenant marketing campaign goes. But, you know, again, I just want to encourage you. Don't be discouraged. You know, really, you got to learn from the things that go wrong. I, I really look at these incidents as uh, learning opportunities for me. And as I learn, I get better and I get better and better at uh, you know, managing these assets and uh, doing the right thing and helping to train other people to do the right thing so that we'll avoid that same mistake in the future. This is a learning game and those that keep moving forward will win. You just got to keep your focus. Well, that's it for today. Uh, please note, old dog listeners, everything presented here today, including any links that I talked about, and there are a few links in there, they can be accessed in our show notes, uh, and they'll be detailed out. So you can look at all this stuff. I, again, uh, I've been talking kind of fast here, but uh, to get through it, you can just look at the notes. And that's at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog. Look for the episode entitled Slugging It Out in the Trenches, an Indie Update. So until next time, remember, cash flow is king and real estate investing the means. Thanks again for listening and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.